Uh, welcome, my name is Frank Bones. I'm a professor of innovation and sustainability at the University of Manchester. And I'm here together today with uh, Kene Umiya Siagbu, uh, and he's head of climate change and sustainable agriculture uh, at Tesco, a multinational uh, grocery and retailing company. And we are here to talk uh, about ecological sustainability. Uh, so this is the sustainable development that uh, focuses on uh, natural ecology, uh, ecologies. And we are particularly interested in how ecological sustainability is managed at a company like Tesco. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, and maybe you can start by telling us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, so how did you uh, grow into this role of uh, head of climate change and uh, agricultural sustainability at Tesco? Thanks, Frank. Um, as you said, I, I head up the climate change and sustainable agriculture team at Tesco. I've been at Tesco two years now. And prior to that, I worked as a consultant for about five years um, in a number of consultancies, including the Carbon Trust. My focus was always around sustainability consulting. Um, and I advised a number of uh, large multinational companies and smaller companies as well around how to drive some of the initiatives around environmental sustainability, but also around social and ethical issues like human rights, child labor, and, and so on. Prior to consulting, though, I spent quite a, a big chunk of my career at Cadbury. First Cadbury Schweppes, the group, and then Cadbury when eventually the Schweppes business was sold. Um, and I worked in a number of areas uh, for, the, for the global organization uh, mostly again around sustainability, so uh, social sustainability, ethical trading, um, human rights again, food security and so on. But also worked in the environment side of things, especially around embedding sustainability into how business decisions are made. Prior to Cadbury, I, I also worked for a charity, a non-profit organization, a youth leadership charity called ISEC and worked in a number of countries in, in, in uh, the Netherlands for ISEC International, but also for ISEC in Brazil, in Estonia, and in Nigeria, where I'm from. And before all of that, I, was, I studied geology in the 90s and majored in hydrogeology. And it was actually while I was studying as a, as a, a geologist in Nigeria that I got uh, exposed to the environmental impacts of oil drilling uh, off the coast of Nigeria in the Niger Delta and that led to a reappraisal, a reassessment of my preferences and passions and I moved from a focus on petroleum geology to hydrogeology and, and that set me on the path that I am now. Um, while I was at Cadbury I also did a part-time um, a master's program at the University of Bath studying especially corporate responsibility. How do you take all these ideas of sustainability and corporate responsibility and make them effective in business. And I did it at a time in my career where I could reflect on my practice. I was already working at Cadbury, driving some of these initiatives. And so it was a course that enabled me the space to think what I was doing in real time and reflect how I could improve it. So I suppose all of that together is what I might be reflecting in our conversations mm -hmm. today. So, and, and, and can you tell us a little bit more about your particular passion for, for sustainability and, and also uh, bringing that uh, into business, so to speak? Yeah. You know? so because from geology to uh, being a manager at Tesco, yeah. that might seem like a, a big leap to some people. Yeah, so I think to the point I mentioned, the, 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 the experience of the Niger Delta in, in Nigeria, knowing what, the Ni what was happening in the Niger Delta mm -hmm. in terms of Nigeria as a nation needed the resources, the, 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 the money that came from oil to fund a lot, of, a lot of what was going on, a lot of infrastructure, education, healthcare, all those things. So we depended as a nation on, on, on oil revenues as a, as a country. However, one couldn't ignore the enormous impact it was having on the people on whose, on whose land the oil was coming from. There were minority communities in the in the south southernmost part of Nigeria. So, as a political group, they didn't really have the numbers to win votes at a federal level, and so they could broadly be ignored. And, and under the military dictatorship we had at the time I was growing up, they were largely ignored, mm -hmm. and that had knock-on effects and led <coughs> to uh, kind of you know unrest and eventually terrorism in in that part of the of the Niger Delta affected the 
social fabric of those communities. The schools didn't function. The environmental pollution meant people couldn't go to work and so on. And so it, it led me to a questioning of kind of understanding how it is that something that could be positive, like generating revenues for a con country, could also have such, I suppose I can use the word, devastating effect on communities. Mm -hmm. And that interplay between the environment, human rights, community rights, and of course political stability became an, a, a theme I wanted to explore, which is what led me to working for a non-profit organization. And I chose to work in developing or emerging economies just to understand a little bit more how other countries were managing that sort of transition. Um, I became convinced of the role that business must play in resolving some of these things. And I think one of the most powerful arguments that persuaded me of the role of business was actually a, a, a talk I heard where a business leader himself was arguing that business was neither saint nor sinner. It wasn't really interested in destroying, or you know, one could argue, uh, many businesses are not interested in creating social value. They are mostly interested in growing shareholder value. And of course, individuals within business would like to do that in the most responsible way they can um, and sometimes they need help to find out what this most responsible way is and the most practical way to do it while also growing shareholder value and so I decided that business was probably the place I could make my best impact and and therefore mm -hmm. I, I joined Cadbury after I left the the charity and followed that career yeah. path to today. Okay uh, Maybe we can move now to Tesco to uh, talk a little bit about uh, how that particular company is, is dealing with questions of ecological sustainability. Uh, and maybe we can start by uh, you outlining uh, what are the particular challenges at that, uh, uh, you know, on that topic uh, for Tesco's. Yes. Um, so I suppose, you know, Tesco is a, is a big Mm -hmm. Company, it's a, it's the it's the UK's biggest supermarket chain. It's the world, the world's second largest supermarket mm -hmm. by revenue, yeah. and uh, and so and and of course, the, the, I suppose that that brings with it an enormous opportunity. Also brings with it some challenges. One of the biggest challenges is that we are a retailer. We don't own farms. We don't own manufacturing facilities we actually depend on another person, people in our supply chain, to produce even own label Tesco products. So, so in a way, not many companies have the reality that the label that, that goes on their products is attached to their products by somebody else in, in, down in the supply yeah. chain. That means that we have almost a, we have a responsibility for the brand, but sometimes we have only influence on the suppliers down our supply mm -hmm. chain. So that kind of brings with it the next type of challenge, which is because we are a brand that people interact with very often. We're not, we're not mm -hmm. like a, an obscure manufacturer of a zipper that goes in your trouser. We, we, are, we relate to people on something that they care about a lot, which is the food they eat, mm -hmm. the food they give to their loved ones. And they have an interaction with us every week, some every day or mo mm -hmm. a few times a week. That means where brand they recognize, the brand they have some kind of view or emotional connection with. And I think it's been the case that uh, probably in the past 10 to 15 years, the, the view in the UK, which is our biggest market of Tesco, has been that Tesco has become too big. It's affecting society a little bit negatively in terms of opening up in high streets, in, in terms of impact that it's perceived to have. On, on suppliers and so on. And, and I think there's also a, a tension between um, kind of society wanting the most efficient and therefore the cheapest food delivered to them mm -hmm. and also a perception that that might lead to mm -hmm. a compromising of quality, which, which by the way is not the case at, at Tesco. But this, these are perceptions that we have mm -hmm. to deal with and then it affects almost everything the company does. And so there's, an, there's a presumption that Tesco would always find the, so in, in a way efficiency is then viewed as finding the shortcut that Tesco would always find the short, shortcut to things. And therefore, we start from a presumption of not wanting to do the right thing. 
and then become targets of campaigns and criticism that can make the business a little bit too defensive in there for going out and saying, here's what we're doing right and so on and so forth. So these are, these are probably two of our biggest challenges, the fact that we don't have influence of, uh, all through the tiers of our supply chain and the fact that there is probably a perception that Tesco is aggressive and ruthless. And overlay that with the third one, which is the, the diversity of issues we have to deal with. When I worked at Cadbury, we, you know, what was most important to us above everything else was cocoa. Maybe some of the milk that comes into yeah, yeah. our products, some sugar. But if you list all the products, all the raw materials we sourced at Cadbury, there were less than 10, you know, nuts, yeah, yeah. you know, raisins, all of that. And when you think about Tesco, we have thousands and thousands of lines, each of them with com a complex production systems. And so as a business, we look at it and say, well, gosh, where do we start? Do we start with the beef or the tomatoes or the carrots? Or, you know, and uh, we have a supply chain that spreads around the world. And those three things, I think, makes it a little bit it can be a little bit overwhelming for the business to decide where exactly are we going to start in addressing environmental sustainability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I understand what you're saying. You're sort of uh, uh, pointing out sort of the critical issues from the management uh, perspective, so to speak. Uh, I'm also interested in, in taking one step back and simply asking the question, uh, uh, you know, what are the issues in terms of uh, affecting natural ecologies. Yeah. So what is actually your impact on the natural environment uh, where you think that, that, you know, that your effort should be uh, uh, in terms of addressing that? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, about two years ago, actually, we, we took another look at, at the way we've laid out our environmental sustainability agenda. And we started by asking ourselves at the time, we, as a business, we had a commitment to reduce our impact on the environment. You know, that mm -hmm. is still our commitment, mm -hmm. but we want to do more than just reduce. We want to make a positive contribu contribution where we can. But starting with that, we asked ourselves, well, what are the environments we have an impact upon? So mm -hmm. similar to the question you've just asked. And we laid out about five environments that we think accounts for 80, maybe 90 percent of all the mm -hmm. impacts we have. And the first is the climate. We have an impact on the climate, both through our own operations, and I can go into more detail on that later on, but also through our supply chain. We have an, an impact on, marine, on the marine environment, so the sourcing of uh, seafood, for instance, tuna being the most visible that people know about, but the sourcing of all seafood have an impact on the marine environment. We have an impact on rainforests, and particularly five, uh, four global drivers of deforestation that are relevant to us, which, uh, which are timber, soy, palm oil, and Amazonian beef. There are other global drivers uh, which are not that relevant. For instance, mm -hmm. mining is not that relevant yeah. to us because we're not a mining company. And there are other regional drivers of deforestation like cocoa or tea and so on. But these four are the global drivers, the ones that proportionately mm -hmm. drive the biggest impact. So we do have an impact on forests. We also have an impact on farmlands or we have an impact through agriculture, especially in places where agriculture is no longer happening in, in, a, in a rainforest, for instance. Yeah. So agriculture in, in the Mediterranean region, in, in the UK here or in, 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 in Northern Africa or elsewhere in Africa. So we have that. And then we also have our impact on freshwater bodies. So those are the five environments, the climate, forests, marine, agriculture, and freshwater bodies. These are the, that's the, the, the uh, kind of the environments or ecosystems we think if we address, if we get it right, we'll be addressing at least 80 or more percent of our environmental impacts. Yeah. Okay, so two questions sort of relate to that, uh, uh, I would say. So one question is, how do you actually make an assessment like that? Mm. And so how do you do you come to the conclusion that those are like the, the main areas where you uh, where you're impacting? Uh, another question is, given the sort of the you know you're almost talking about Everything. Earth, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, so how do you make decisions, or within your company? I'm I'm sort of guessing that you're not the only one making the decisions. Sure. You know, so how do you as a company make decisions about how to prioritize yeah. uh, among all those impacts? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and so to, to your first question, how, how did we map out these impacts? Yeah. I think a number of ways, you know, first we went out and spoke to experts, you know, so, so some were friends, mm -hmm. some were critical friends, some were, 
opponents, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so some of the companies, would, some of the organizations would come to us, you know, through a campaign or through criticism and say, you're not paying enough attention to this matter. Mm -hmm. And I touched on Tuna as an example. Greenpeace um, led a campaign against a number of companies, including retailers, around the sourcing of tuna and gave us a depth of insight into the issue that we didn't have previously. And we listened to it. We engaged with them and said, we need to understand this a little bit more. We looked at what the science was saying and so on. And we mapped where does tuna sit in the wider marine sustainability strategy we have. You know, we ourselves put climate change on the agenda. You know, uh, 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 previous leadership had already identified climate change as one of the most profound environmental problems that humanity was facing and it would have an impact on our security of supply, on the way we live, on our operations mm -hmm. and so on. So we already put that on, on, the, on the map ourselves and we learn a lot from conversations. For instance, uh, we, we, we uh, focused a lot of our strategy around the output of the Stern Review when that came out mm -hmm. in the noughties. So that's, that's another example. We um, also got both com a combination of ourselves and industry as a whole put the question of forests and deforestation on the map where members of the Consumer Goods Forum, which is a forum of big uh, manufacturing and retail businesses in the consumer goods yeah. sector working together, you know. Um, and one of the earliest work that that group did at, in sustainability was actually done at a time when Tesco and Unilever together were leading the sustainability th uh, thread or pillar of the CGF. And there we, the, the Consumer Goods Forum, yeah. So, uh, and, and under that group, we mapped deforestation as one of the environmental impacts our industry as a whole was mm -hmm. having. Yeah. So, so that's an example of one that, came, that, w that became an area of focus based on how we've all agreed as an industry. And so then again, the question, what, so how do you decide as an industry that that is an important yeah. uh, topic? You know, is that uh, sort of driven by resource scarcity or what are the sort of the... So uh, it's, a lot of it is driven by research. It would be a lot of researchers speaking to different of our organizations directly mm -hmm. saying, we think that looking into the future, this is an issue that's going to affect you. This is the impact you're having today. Uh, some of it would be what our own internal experts as organizations are saying, you know, these are some of the issues that we, we see when we go to yeah. source these issues. Mm -hmm. Or it could also be sometimes government policies in parts of the world that say, you know, we're paying attention to, to the long-term impact of some of these things. And so, so that, it's a combination of factors, our own internal expertise, the expertise of campaigners, of policymakers, and so mm -hmm. on. All of that feeds into a, a deeper understanding of exactly what the issues are mm -hmm. and then deciding exactly what our, what our response should be. So, so a number of sources leads yeah. to that. Now, the, the our impact on agriculture is an interesting one because that's not one that there has been any campaign activity around necessarily at least targeting us. Um, but we went out on our own and went out to more than 30 different stakeholders from academia, from other, uh, other businesses, NGOs, you know, campaigners, and spoke to them and said, what are the issues we ought to be thinking about around agriculture? How might agriculture, at least our environmental issues in agriculture, affect our business in the medium to long term? And also what impact might we be having on, on the environment through mm -hmm. agricultural activities in the short, medium, and long term. And that enabled us to scope out and shape an, a, an a environmental strategy around agriculture and, 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 and the same with fresh water. So it's a combination of ways that we get to map out what we should yeah. be focusing on, academic input, campaigners, policymakers, our own expertise, and our own research, and so on. And to what extent, <coughs> sorry, to what extent do consumers also uh, play a role in that and how do you take their sort of uh, opinion or position into account? Yeah, absolutely. Consumers are, of course, the, the, I suppose the, the, the heart of our business. If we don't get it right for our customers and our consumers, we really won't have a business. Mm -hmm. Now, often consumers don't get into the details, the scientific details of the issues, but they tell us what their values are. They tell us they want a company that's responsible. They want to buy products that doesn't require them to compromise their own values. They tell us they don't want to feel guilty having bought their favorite products. They might not have a solution. They might not be able to say, this is what we think, therefore, you should do. 
but they look to us to say, well, you're the big company. You have the resources. We'd like you to address this. And, and if I get, a, you know, some of the ways that campaigners try and bring a, a sharp focus on a particular issue is by actually um, persuading consumers or customers to write to businesses like ourselves, to indicate to businesses mm -hmm. like ourselves that they, this is one issue that they'd like us to address. And so they, of course, play a strong role in helping us identify the ones that are, of course, top of the agenda. We don't, however, wait for customers or consumers to tell us. We, we, ex we know that they expect us to be addressing these issues already. So we don't wait for them to tell us that food, issue, food waste, for instance, is a massive issue before we start dealing with it. But when we choose our strategy, when we decide what it is we do, we also go out and ask customers. We run, we run a, a customer insights and research programs to check with them. Are we addressing it in the right way? Are we getting to the points that matters to you? So, so, so you know, they start, they are, in that sense, they act as a, a powerful sounding board for us. And sometimes they are, the, they, they are a key stakeholder in pointing us to the issues that they really want us to address. But if we keep our strategy just on the things that we've been campaigned against or the things that customers have pointed out to us, that might be quite irresponsible because customers don't have as much insight into mm -hmm. our own supply chain as we do, as our experiences give us. Okay. And then the prioritization of the, the sort of the different impacts. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. So as, as where we start as a, as a business is actually, again, we, we take that uh, kind of uh, more than one input source. Where, where we start as a business is to look at the biggest products that we sell. So which are the ones that we're big in, the ones we sell the most, the ones the customers want the most, or the ones that have the biggest em environmental impact. Mm -hmm. And so one way we do it is to look at our, if I take a number, like top 20 products that our customers mm -hmm. buy every, every week. Yeah. And that will tell you that these are the ones that we sell the biggest volumes. Mm -hmm. And so say bananas and milk, we'll sell more of it than we'll sell I don't know, um, mangoes, as an example. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to focus our resources, we'll focus it on those bits where we're big in, that means we'll have a big influence because we'll be a big player with our suppliers. And even if it's an industry issue that we need to resolve, we can convene the whole industry. So that's a starting point. We also pay attention to um, products or supply chains that might pose a risk to our brand or reputation as a business. So we listen to the ones that customers have expressed a strong interest in, yeah. you know, and we go with that as well. We include that in our considerations. And now, we also look at the ones that campaigners say to us, this is not an issue today, but it will be tomorrow. You need to pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. And so we, we add that into the mix. When you've got all of those, the top products in your supply chain, the, the, the guidance or the directions given to you by customers or campaigners, you start to get a map of the products mm -hmm. you're looking at, and those products take you the, to the environments on which they have an impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so. Okay, and to what extent is that complicated by the fact that you're an international company? Because, I mean, some of the considerations for prior prioritizing issues, uh, they, they will be global, but yes. many of them will also be like local or yes. sort of specific to local markets. Yes, so yes. can you tell us a little bit about how you yes. deal with that? Yeah, it, it can complicate issues because you have a number of um, their cultural issues to mm -hmm. bear in mind. Sometimes, you know, you have that some of the issues that the UK consumer cares a lot about and would actually play an active role in finding a resolution to. You go to some other markets, it's not really on their radar. You, you know, you go to some other markets and it's not something they're aware of. And so looking at it purely from a market or customer driven perspective in that sense would therefore mean that we only address it in the UK mm -hmm. is, is an example. The other bit is actually the doing. Again, in some, con in some countries, the, either the law uh, or, or the enforcement of the law is weak, is weak or lacking. And that means that you, in a way, we find it a little bit difficult to stand back and say, as long as our suppliers act in accordance with the law, everything mm -hmm. will be all right. And, and there, therefore, we have to work more closely with the suppliers. We have to give more support. We have to track and audit a little bit more actively to make sure that the standards we hold ourselves to are also applied in all mm -hmm. our supply chains, even if the local law 
or, or expectation is n uh, um, are not actually demanding mm. that level of, of so yes it, it adds a bit of complexity mm. if you think about it but that's true for any any major multinational corporation we have to deal and balance uh, yeah. all these all these different realities yeah i know that i understand so it's just a question of you know how do you actually deal with it yeah. okay uh, maybe we can now go to like a more specific project yes. uh, that that your company has been engaged in and tell us a little bit more about it because up till now even though you've given us a lot of information it's still quite sort of uh, uh, generic I would yes. say yes. so maybe you can give an example of a project that's yes. that you have been involved in and how that actually sort of made a contribution but yes. also tell us a little bit about sort of the the things that maybe were difficult in that yes. project yes. Okay, um, I'll, I'll give you an example of a project, but, but first of all, just to, to point out that actually when we speak to our customers about, about trust and responsibility mm -hmm. and all of these issues, some of what we hear from them is actually gives us a strong indication that they don't really, of course it's important to them, but it's not as important to them what we do um, on the periphery of our business so it, it, they might see projects as something we do, having made a profit. Uh, they might see it as the way we spend mm -hmm. our profit, and that's of interest mm -hmm. to them, of course. But mm -hmm. actually, what's more interest of, of, of a bigger interest for them is how we make our money in the first place. How do you run your business? Not necessarily a project on the side. So if they feel that a company, for instance, is not paying the right taxes, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how many streams and rivers we clean up, they still wouldn't think that you're a responsible business. So mm -hmm. if I call it that, therefore, our first biggest project actually yeah. is to go into the heart of the business and make mm -hmm. sure that sustainability is woven into the way we source, the way we run our businesses mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. And, and, and that's kind of the, uh, that's an ongoing job. It's a, it's, a, it's a task that we have to look at the standards mm -hmm. and specifications we give to our suppliers to say, here are the standards we expect you to follow. In mm -hmm. terms of soy or, or palm oil, maybe that's probably one example. We made a commitment um, some years back to source 100% of the palm oil that you know, goes into mm -hmm. our products mm -hmm. from sustainable sources. Mm -hmm. And the timeline was December 2015. Um, and so and, and that's kind of an industry-wide commitment. Now, palm oil is an interesting one. It's, it's, you know, it's, you're unlikely to go into a store in Europe and buy palm oil, yet you buy it all the time. It's in the shampoo that you buy. Yeah. It's, in the, it's in the spreads and the, and the margarine that you use. It's in biscuits. It's in, it's in everything. Yeah? And therefore, that's one that we know that it's in everything and it has an impact. But the average customer might not know. And that's one of the ones that we took upon ourselves that we need to get this sorted. Mm -hmm. And so we started working with other businesses on moving our supply chain, our entire supply chain, all through to sustainable palm oil. We track every year their performance. We put it in our specifications to say that from this year to that year, we expect to see you grow the volume and the ratio of sustainable palm oil you use. We try and find out if there are any problems, if there are systemic problems from source, we go in there with the rest of industry and try to resolve it. And last count, I think we had, we had met just before the deadline, was the last time I checked, we'd met about 90% sustainable physically, uh, uh, physical supply chain. And by that I mean physically segregated as well as mass balance. And the rest of it we've met by uh, supporting the growth of the sustainable palm oil industry by using green certificates, yeah. which other companies mm -hmm. do as well. So that's one example yeah. of, of a project. But its success lies actually not just in running a project where we give people a range of biscuits that has sustainable palm oil in it and the rest doesn't. Yeah? So it's mm -hmm. actually looking at how do we transform all our supply chain to achieve that goal we have. Bananas is another one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe a little bit uh, deeper into that example of palm oil. Yes. So, because one of the things that I hear you say is that it's sort of it starts almost with like an industry agreement. Okay, this is something we are going to tackle. In that in that case, <coughs> yes. yes. Yeah. So, to what extent is that that like a necessary condition almost for uh, taking up something like that, or is it also something that you could do as uh, uh, as a, as an individual company? Yeah, the, so the banana example is is a, a goal that we've chosen as an individual yeah. company. But I I'll probably stop and um, say a little bit more on the palm oil. But the reason that's quite important is that if you think the impact of palm oil, as an example, is in 
in, in, in the impact it has on you know, modern and ancient forests that speed lands in Asia and Indonesia and Malaysia and so on. And while Tesco is a massive uh, supermarket and has a massive impact, actually when you look at it in the scheme of things, we're quite small in terms of our consumption out mm -hmm. of the Indonesian or Malaysian forest. Even if we take up to 10%, and I don't know the number, of, of, uh, 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 of palm oil from, from Malaysia, there's no point getting that 10% of forest in a pristine form while the rest of us were, sur were surrounded mm -hmm. by, by wasteland. Mm -hmm. So actually the gravity, the enormity of the issue requires that all of us actually act together to address those issues, or to avoid the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. you know. And so that's why palm oil is one example. Mm -hmm. Deforestation generally is an issue that's big enough that just sorting out our supply chain is just not enough. What we can do is, of course, sort out our supply chain, but only as an example to others. But the biggest prize comes from working with a broad range of other companies so that all of us together can sort out our supply chains yeah. together. Now, when you come to agriculture, for instance, um, say uh, bananas is, is one example I, I was coming to, or probably tomatoes, where there you could maybe, like if I take an example of a supply chain that has a, a lot of impact on water resources. So say the growth of tomatoes in some parts of Spain mm -hmm. is leading to a, 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 an ongoing reduction of the water table in those parts yeah. of, of the Mediterranean. Now that we can look at as a business and say for our business, for all the regions from which we source tomatoes, we want to make sure that our suppliers are keeping a track of how much water they use and they're reducing that water use year on year. And that's a requirement for, for uh, supplying us. Now that needs us to act on our own as a start and we can make quite a big impact just acting on our yeah. own. So there are, there's a combination. In some cases, we're able to move on our own. In other cases, we need to move as an industry, while, of course, going a little bit farther as an exemplar to others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, an example of a project that hasn't quite worked out was an uh, attempt a few years ago to put a, a carbon label on milk in the UK. We, we, you know, we felt that one of the ways we could help customers make informed decisions was to m um, map the footprint of uh, the carbon footprint of, of a pack of milk and put the figure on the pack for customers. And we did that for many months and tracked customer response. And customers found it confusing. They couldn't understand it. So if they see this footprint, is that good or bad? Should I be eating, uh, using milk or not? Should we, you know, what's the sign? What, what do I do with this information? And a number of other companies tried it as well. Um, when we found that it wasn't leading to the clarity we wanted, it was clouding the issues more, customers didn't know what to do with it, we discontinued that communication element of it. But the information we got from the footprinting was very useful for us. We carry on using a footprinting of our supply chain to understand where we deploy our resources, where the biggest impact exists. So we use it to guide our strategy. We haven't found the most effective way to communicate it to customers. It might be one that we'll come back to. And w what does that tell you about uh, the kind of responsibility you have as a retailer? So, I mean, you started out by, by saying that, you know, you are like in a difficult position because you don't actually sort of produce the stuff that you sell. Yeah. So you, you, you are dependent on suppliers. Yeah. Um, what you're telling now basically means, you know, the consumers, they don't take the responsibility or they don't uh, necessarily, um, uh, you know, can act on the information when you give it to them, which means that you as a company, you know, maybe feel a bigger responsibility uh, for that. Is that the way you look at it or is, is you know, do you have a different position on that as a company? So, so there are two things, um, actually, when, when you come to addressing sustainability, there are two, two ways you can go about it. One is the production side. How can we make production as efficient as possible mm -hmm. and reduce as much as possible the environmental impact of production? Yeah. And there, customers look to us to take the lead because mm -hmm. it's a complicated system. They don't understand it as well mm -hmm. as we do and so on and so forth. Then there, are the, there is the other bit, which is the consumption side of things. That there are some things that no matter how efficient and how, much we pr how well they are produced, if we waste 30% of those resources, if we overconsume some of those resources, there's just no way to make production sustainable. 
-hmm. you can make it as sustainable as possible if the consumption bit hasn't been resolved yeah, yeah, yeah. you know yeah. the, that is the tr that's a r I mean production uh, sorting out sustainability in production is big enough sorting out sustainability in consumption is the real biggie that's the real challenge because that goes beyond the agency of an individual company mm -hmm. and people can instinctively say it goes to the agency of individual consumers and that's probably true but when you come into the challenge the problem of collective action you actually see that we're talking about almost a whole societal reconfiguration of how we consume that's more than anybody's pay scale in business we could have a role to play in it but it's not really something that customers feel comfortable with big business telling them how to consume and so our instinct is to provide as much information as possible to customers and then be guided by their choices what we found with the, car with the carbon labeling is that if the information is too technical, if it's too, mm -hmm. too detailed, the customer might not understand. People le lead busy lives. They don't want to stand on the, on the milk aisle for two hours checking whether mm -hmm. the footprint is right and if the price is right and if the provenance is right, if the animal welfare of the milk, of the, of the cattle that give rise to the milk is good, if the farmers were paid a fair wage and that's just milk and then they move to yogurt and do the same and then to oranges, it's just not realistic. Yeah. So, so some of that we, we accept that we, we can, if we can find an easier, simpler, more engaging way to share this with, with customers, we must. If we can't, we already know that they want us to help them resolve these issues. And the way we resolve it might be to do as much as we can from the production end, but also to raise our hands and say, we think a conversation is needed around consumption, which is why we've been very involved with the Sustainable Consumption Institute here at the University mm -hmm. of Manchester, because we know that that's not a conversation that we can have in isolation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, clear. Um, Maybe th again moving a little bit deeper, you know, into the, uh, but not so much into in, in the specific project, but more in terms of, uh, we talked about more your, your outlook on, uh, on ecological sustainability and uh, sort of the general way in which you make decisions about prioritizing things. Yeah. Uh, another question is about sort of the multitude of tools and concepts that, that nowadays are available uh, for managers also, you know. Yes. Uh, you can do like life cycle analysis, you can do ecological footprinting. I mean, we talked about it in relation to consumers, but yes. for companies, for sure, there is also, I mean, there's, there's so much yes. uh, uh, available. Um, can you share a little bit uh, uh, your thoughts about what are the concepts that you think are, are, are very useful in sort of addressing uh, ecological sustainability issues uh, within business? Yes. Um, so so at, at Tesco, our sustainability agenda, the environmental side of our sustainability agenda resides within a wider um, climate change and responsible sourcing strategy. Mm -hmm. And our responsible sourcing strategy has uh, four main elements. One is addressing commercial relationships because that's an enabler for everything else. Mm -hmm. The other is environmental sustainability, so we tend not to call it Ec ecological sustainability, yeah. we use environmental sustainability. The other is human rights, which looks at the rights of individuals in the workplace, in the, l in the local community, and in wider society or the nation state. And the other bit is animal welfare. So those together look, uh, uh, you know, uh, is what we look at as, as a responsible mm -hmm. sourcing strategy. And then of course we have our own operational impact that makes up our sustainability agenda. Now, when it comes to the concepts that we apply, you know, <laughs> business is, is not really, I suppose, is quite different from academia, that we don't need big concepts. We don't need to uh, present these ideas in big intellectual concepts. Mm -hmm. Now, the uh, concepts might be useful for the individuals driving the sustainability agenda, but actually the learning the issues, understanding the issues, is just the foundation of for an effective sustainability mm -hmm. uh, practitioner within business. Yeah? And so understanding the, th the theory of the issue, the science of how to resolve it, is the start. The most important thing, actually having understood that now, is understanding how to make business address them. Mm -hmm. you know? How to make business address them in the light of 
commercial realities, the reputational realities, of the interest of investors, of the mandate of business to grow shareholder value. And of course, of a practice that you might see in a number of, of businesses, which, you know, trying to find the balance between short term or quarterly results and the long term mm -hmm. focus. And a lot of the things we are discussing today around sustainability, the clues in the name, it's actually dealing more with issues in the long, in the medium to long term. Now, the, the job of a practitioner like me in house is how do we find the right way to take these ideas that we've learned, that we understand either as scientists, as practitioners, as students, or whatever else, and how do we embed it into the way we do business? Mm -hmm. Now, you could choose, one could choose a career to, to make this contribution as a consultant, where you'll be the one doing the technical number crunching, always updating information and providing the footprint and the scientific evidence to make the case. And that's an important role in the sustainability uh, career sphere. But one could also play the role of being the person that takes this idea to market, the person who goes to the business and mm -hmm. makes the business case, for, mm -hmm. you know, to say, if we don't do this, here are the risks, or if we get it right, here are the opportunities. And one will need to find the right way to, Im to weave it into the language of business, into the plans of business, into the reality of business, and into the priorities of the leadership. And that actually can be sometimes more difficult than just understanding the theory of how deforestation happens or how um, mm -hmm. uh, marine ecosystems might be affected by acidification. So, I mean, you, you've mentioned, I think, this a couple of times now, uh, uh, which is, I mean, it's more about working with people, yes, both within the company Correct. and also with suppliers, Correct. but even with stakeholders, you know, in sort Absolutely. of getting their position on, on how they look at things. So what 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 is, you know, can can you sort of say something? I mean, it's like to to a great extent uh, that's also about like your personal skills, you yes. know, that you have as a as a manager. Absolutely. But can you say something more generic about it? So what what are useful ways, or what has helped you in sort of learning how to develop those skills and becoming better in? in interacting with other people within your company and beyond the boundary of your company yes. to uh, to convince them of both of the of the necessity of dealing with ecological sustainability but also of making it uh, a, a viable business proposition yeah. so i think uh, um and and uh, it's an interesting question is you know in my in my master's course that was actually the question i looked at how do you uh, how do you exercise personal agency in a big company mm -hmm. in this area and it was something i spent two years exploring trying to understand um and of course there's always uh, there's always more to learn from yeah, one's yeah. experience and, and and other people's the the key thing that i found is actually of course the basic the foundation is that you need to understand the issues the sustainability mm -hmm. issues that you're dealing with and understand how it interacts with your business but the impact you're having and the impact they could have on your business. That's, that's of course, a good foundation. Um, the, the next thing, actually, is to understand business, they understand how, to understand how business makes decisions, how the mindset of business works, and how th what, what are on the priority lists of the leaders of business. That's an, a very important thing, because I find that uh, when I speak to those whose career have been in the nonprofit sector or those whose career have been in academia, you know, for instance, in, in academics, I find them to be guided. I mean, the goal, at least, is that they be guided fully by the facts as they see it. Mm -hmm. If the facts say this, this is where I go. Business, of course, tries, uh, it tries very hard to be guided by facts. But it's not just facts that guides business. It's the sentiments of the market. How does the market view my plan? How do investors react? What do customers care about? What would have an impact on my reputation? All of that have an influence on the, on the facts you have on the table. But also business has the ability, it, its success is somewhat rooted in its ruthless ability to focus on the essential, to strip out all the complexity and just go for the three or four priorities which will make the most difference. And sometimes you, you, I speak to ca campaigners and say, oh, you can nail it down to just three. Well, you better find a way to, because if it's more than three, if it goes into seven, eight, nine, ten, it's too complicated. Business will ask you to strip it right down to three. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if you have those three or four priorities, your job as a sustainability practitioner is to find which one should serve as an anchor for your strategy. Which one is the one that if you can find a link between that and what you're trying to achieve, then you have a successful outcome. So let's say a supply chain director might be saying that the thing that's keeping me up at night is I'm about to sign this long-term partnership with this supplier of tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And I'm worried if I put all my volumes in this supplier of tomatoes, will they go out of business in five years' time, in seven years' time? Mm -hmm. And I'm signing a 10-year partnership. So that might be their headache. And as a sustainability practitioner, you might find an opportunity there to say, okay, that's a very good point. Now, part of what might make them go out of business is environmental impact. So as you're doing that review of checking exactly whether this is the right partner to go for, let's include an environmental impact assessment and look at long-term modeling where they're growing their tomatoes, what might be the impact that climate change might have on it in the next seven or 10 years. So now you're helping them answer a business question, but as the expert in sustainability, you've made sure that environmental sustainability has now been included as one of the considerations. Now, that is a skill that a number of people who have just the theoretical knowledge of sustainability, but very little understanding of business, find missing. And they end up finding themselves bang, you know, banging their head against a brick wall on each occasion because mm -hmm they're speaking a language that business doesn't understand and they can't really translate. There's a, role for, you know, there's a role for such people, but maybe that role is stronger in, in consulting or in campaigning. When one is inside business, there is a strong need to understand business and be able to translate your logic into a language that business can appreciate. Okay, thank you. Very insightful. Uh, Maybe to uh, close off uh, uh, this uh, interview, uh, and you've already given us a lot of your sort of uh, insights uh, that, that, that I think will be very helpful, um, but maybe you have like one particular piece of advice for people who are, uh, you know, a little bit earlier in their career. Um, so what, what would be your sort of insight that you can give them uh, that they can uh, uh, use to develop their own career? Yeah. Um, I think the, the field of sustainability, um, so social, environmental sustainability, is a very exciting space. It's a very exciting part of business. Uh, I would say that, wouldn't I? I've spent 15 years in this field. That's the career that I've chosen for myself. But the reason I'm, I'm here is because it's that, uh, it's that uh, confluence between um, driving an impact and leveraging the scale and size of business. Um, I think a lot of there's a whole ecosystem of careers in sustainability, and each person I would advise would be best served by thinking which of which area of this field plays well to to their instincts as people, to their values, and to their action logic. How do they organize their thought? So, if someone, for instance, is of the view that there is that the business, the the nature of business, needs to be overhauled completely. And there's an argument for that, um, that the nature of consumption, the nature of capitalism and, and value needs to be overhauled. Perhaps that is someone more suited to policy conversations, to transformation of, 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 of intergovernmental institutions than to business, for instance. If, however, if someone holds that view but also thinks, while we do that, business, there's a lot of room that business can play in. There's a lot that business can do already today, then that could be a person that can play a role within business. The place to start, in my view, is to get to know business, to understand business either through interaction or, or, or education or immersion. Take a commercial role, take a non-traditional sustainability role, as long as you keep your vision that the reason you're doing this is to be effective in a sustainability role, you can return to it in three years, in five years, having, uh, having understood how business planning is done, when resource allocation is made, how you can include important things in the KPIs and the key performance indicators of business so that you don't have to go negotiating each time for middle managers mm -hmm. to do it because it's already in the things yeah. they're measured yeah. against. So once you understand the fabric and the nature of business cycles and how the business instinct works, then you become more effective in that sense. So again, it's not for everybody. You know, some people would feel most comfortable being guided by facts 100% of the time. 
there are not many businesses that will be guided only by facts 100% of the time. Yeah? And so that's, that's, that's something to bear in mind. And, and yes, you'd mentioned the bit of personal relations. Having got all of these things right, the relationships you build in business and in a field like sustainability, it's, um, it's actually company-wide. Your influence is company-wide. So on, on one day, I can be in a meeting with our energy team who decide how we use energy across our estates. Mm -hmm. Next minute, I'm speaking to someone who decide how we buy the electricity that we consume. And then I'm speaking to the standards team who set the agri animal welfare standards. And next, I'm speaking to a commercial colleague about a, a supplier uh, somewhere in, in South America or in Africa who I need to have a conversation with about raising their game. And so on. So in the end, actually, sustainability roles tend to cover, span the whole company, requiring different skills, different approaches, different styles to engage with each other people. And the secret is as many of them as possible, helpfully, if all of them can see you as supporting and helping their agenda, then when, when you come down the corridor, they don't go, oh God, yeah, here yeah. he comes again. Yeah, Then they can say, actually, yeah, if I support yeah. them, they can actually support me in driving my own ambitions. And, and that, that way you're more effective yeah. within business. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.